Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We have a plethora of guests today, including one that you might recognize from previous episodes. Welcome back to Gareth Ford Williams, who is in charge of accessibility at the BBC, still after all of this time, um, and was our first ever guest on Access Chat. So welcome back, Gareth. We've also got Bruno Mag and David Bailey joining us. And today's topic is one that I'm particularly interested in, which is around making fonts and typefaces accessible. So um, if you would care to introduce yourselves, Gareth, do you want to start if I've done you an injustice in my introduction? No, no, this is a good introduction. So pretty much covers everything. So I'm now, my title I think has changed. This is the third time I'm on and it'll probably the third job title. Uh, but still running running the accessibility team so now head of design uh, slash accessibility um, and I'm also uh, running the uh, assistive technology team um, in the BBC as well um, and uh, yeah I, I mean this is a topic that's also you know I've been massively interested in for a long time dabbled in in the past and and then uh, had the fortune of meeting Bruno and David and um, yeah now got really sucked into the subject <laughs> In a big way, but I'll let them, you know, sort of explain why. Excellent. So, Bruno, do you want to tell us a yes. bit about your background, please? Yes. Uh, I am the chairman and founder of Dalton Mark, which is a type foundry based in London. Uh, we've been going for nearly 31 years now. So, uh, no, what I'm talking about? 20, 20, no, 20, what, 29 years. Apologies. 20, 29 years. And um, yeah, we, we make fonts, you know, have primarily custom fonts. So uh, some of the work we have done is obviously with the BBC, the BBC Reese typefaces, but we've also worked with Amazon, uh, Netflix, Airbnb, like primarily the large tech corporates. Uh, but we also do smaller projects, you know, and of course with the big companies, accessibility is always kind of like it's it's one of the baseline requirements obviously and particularly if you work in a digital environment you have to have accessibility you have to have uh, typefaces that actually function within a ui environment you know and beyond that of course as well because they have to be in print as well um about six years ago or so seven years ago i got much more involved uh, and interested in uh, in the accessibility side of it and uh, started getting involved into uh, neuroscience. Uh, my wife is a neuroscientist and together with her we ha used to have like two o'clock in the morning Prosecco fueled conversations about typeface designs and neuroscience and then we started realizing that there's a big overlap there as well. Uh, so much so that I did a lot of background reading and uh, also in particular with the subject of dyslexia and uh, trying to dispel, dispel some myths, you know, and uh, in doing so dispelling the myths, you know, obviously upsetting a lot of people as well because people can't cope with home truths. And, um, yeah, and that's sort of like how I really got into the whole accessibility side uh, and having all that knowledge of the neuroscience now really informs how we design as well. You know, it's kind of like we make yeah. we make the decisions much more conscious, consciously, you know, rather than just intuitively. You know, if we make a decision about a design or the letter spacing, we know why it is and we can argue it as well. So Excellent. that's briefly about me. David. Hi folks, um, so I'm David Bailey. Uh, I'm UX, I'm user experience principal for visual design and branding at the BBC. My role is to sort of help drive consistent high quality design and brand experience across our entire online output. Prior to that, I was, um, I've been with the BBC for about six years now, uh, but prior to the role I'm in currently, I was creative director of our global experience language, which is our shared design framework and accessibility is baked into all everything that we do in all of our output in our department. Um, so uh, I've, I was really involved in that, in evolving that design framework for the organization in all the right ways. And then prior to that, I spent sort of about 16 years working in uh, commercial sector. I used to work with a very fam famous design studio called the Designers Republic 
who were kind of a, a sort of cutting edge design studio in the 90s and the 2000s. And then I ran my own studio, Kiosk, which did much more of the same. So lots of art direction, traditional graphic design and branding, for the music industry, arts, fashion, film, TV, media, all sorts of good stuff. So coming to the BBC, I've been on a huge learning curve and now I'm kind of this hybrid of sort of brand design specialist as well as UX uh, design framework thinking, design system thinking uh, specialist as well, combined into this principal role. So, um, and I love it. Well done. Excellent. So um, that's great. And, and if people are wondering why Deborah's disappeared, she lives in rural Virginia and has the worst internet in the, uh, the developed world. Uh, she will be back shortly. Um, but so if I go to Gareth, uh, what was it that prompted you to, to start doing the, the work on developing um, dyslexia, particularly dyslexia accessible fonts? I know that you'd, you'd done work before the development of Reef, but, but you, you, you developed this typeface. And well, it, it, it was a, uh, it was a was funny one. Yeah. It? Well, it was. I mean, obviously, I'm being, I'm, I'm dyslexic myself, and and it was, it was something that I'd been interested in, but I couldn't find a huge amount of, of really, you know, sort of good, conclusive, hard evidence out there. And this goes back to my time when I was at UView, um, on when I was, I was on secondment to UView for two years for the part of the team. Um, that designed and built uh, the interface and the, and the hardware behind it. And one of the things we were looking at was the, the UI typeface. And I went out looking for stuff and I could find a lot of claims and I could find a lot of people talking about it and I couldn't find a huge amount of evidence. Yeah. Um, I, admittedly, I probably didn't look deep enough, particularly into the neuroscientific <laughs> side. And if, until I met Bruno, I, <laughs> I wasn't prompted into start looking in that area. It was like, where do you start? But uh, I always felt like this was one of those foundation things that was missing in the world of accessibility. People talk a lot about typography or at least, you know, the presentation of type, but what about the actual typeface itself? And there was, you know, there's lots of spurious claims about, about, you know, the comic sans, you know, <laughs> um, claims that are out there, but I can never find anything. It all seemed to be anecdote. That's an anecdote. Anecdote is always interesting because it helps you raise good, you know, raise questions and actually explore whether there are research questions but actually evidence was massively missing and so we did the best we could um when i was at uview and then really it was actually um it's a question that's probably aimed at, at probably david to start off with because you david started or was really right this this the starting point of this whole idea of the bbc having a single typeface and that's when the conversation started and and then, you know, we started working with Alton Mag, but David can give you some of that kind of history. And I just kind of just got sucked into this because I just thought I was never able to actually find the answers, find the things that I wanted. Um, when, when I worked at UView, we, we, did, we did the best we could. And we made quite, you know, a good, a good decision, I think, in the end. But it always felt like there was so much more to this and so much missing um, uh, in opportunity. Um, so I don't know, uh, David, do you want to? Yeah, I'm happy to tell you a bit about that. So when I joined the BBC, um, as I said before, I joined as creative director of, of our design framework, the global experience language. And I saw my remit was to kind of raise the profile of that and make it m more buy into it, more belief in it as our design system that all our designers could get behind and, and develop as a group. Um, and, but I was also looking for ways for the, for, to kind of evolve its visual styling and, and its personality and presence and, and the, a core element of any kind of brand or brand system or visual design system is the typeface. And the typefaces that, that, that our design system was using was Helvetica, which is a system typeface, a grotesque typeface designed 100 years ago for print. Um, and somewhat invisible. It, 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 and you could argue that it being invisible is a good thing for a public service uh, organization that has to be sort of um, yeah. neutral in its political opinion, et cetera. It, it kind of suits that in some respects because it's David, somewhat neutral. It's, yeah. it's just pure information. Sorry. Go ahead. For some of our audience that, that are, uh, are not so uh, knowledgeable about typefaces, can you um, explain the difference between grotesque typefaces? And yeah. Do you want me so, to do uh, that, David, or do you want oh, to? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I don't mind. 
I mean, I can give the, the very the very quick version of it, and you could maybe fill in if I've got anything wrong. But briefly speak, very broadly speaking, a grotesque typeface has more sort of equal proportions and is more sort of it's designed around its delivery of information. It doesn't have any kind of flair or flow. It's very much. It's, it's just, uh, actually, Bruno probably would be better at describing it. Yeah, yeah. Basically, in a grotesque typeface, it's the impression you get is that they are constructed, almost yeah. mechanical typefaces. So you will find that the character widths tend to be very even, pretty much the same from one character to another. For example, if you think of the lower cases, think of the, the A, the B, the C, the E, etc. You know, they, they all pretty much sit, sit on the same width. Also, the characters tend to look very closed in. Again, if you look, think of the C, for example, you find that the jaws are really coming close together. So that, of course, creates a degree of ambiguity as well. Yes. Uh, grotesque typefaces are, for example, like Ariel, Helvetica, Accidents Grotesque is another one, Universe is another one. So these are the more famous ones. But I say the basic principle is relatively high X height, relatively short ascender and descender. So the descender is the bit that sticks down below, like in the P or in the G. The ascender is the bit that sticks up, um, like the H or the F for example. Uh, so they tend to be quite short as well, which then also gives you quite dense impression when you, when you typeset it, when you look at it in, in composition as well. As opposed to that, you have humanist typefaces. And we're talking about sans serifs now. You have humanist typefaces, uh, which have more varied proportion. And by and large, the character shapes tend to be open. Again, if you have, if you think of the lowercase c or the cap c, it has open jaws, you know, and that creates much more variety within the individual shapes as well. Also, humanist typefaces tend to have a more relaxed letter spacing than grotesque, which tend to be quite tightly spaced as well. Uh, so that's that's basically the two kind of like signifiers between those two main um, kind of like uh, stylistic features of sans serifs. So over to David. Yeah. yeah, thanks Bruno. So, and I think designers, graphic designers, really like grotesque typefaces because they have a kind of a modern flavor. And I think that's probably born out of all the corporate identities and science fiction films and road signage and things that people see in the world and feel kind of like systemizing and and neutral and I think designers go towards that because it feels like a safe bet and it has a modern flavour. So because of that, you see a hell of a lot of Helvetica, which is a very famous grotesque typeface. You see a lot of it in the world. Um, and I think that we, so that was the typeface that Joel was using and it was fine, but, it, but we, we felt that there, but we knew that there were some accessibility concerns with it because of the, some of the things that Bruno just said about there being quite close proportions. It's, it's difficult for the eye to saccadically scan the words and get through it very quickly. So depending on your ability or your, your ability with reading or whatever, it, will, it, will, it could kind of uh, harm your sort of experience or slow you down somewhat. So there was, that was one hook that we saw, I saw and it will help solve that problem so that's great because accessibility runs through everything the bbc does and am i cutting out folks can you still hear you, me? you did for briefly but you're back now yeah so my selfish interest was introduce a new typeface but accessibility if we could fix some accessibility questions then issues then that would be a really good driver for me to sort of take this to the business and say we need this typeface not because we want to look new and modern and all of those things but for these reasons and this was one of them accessibility legibility readability of typefaces on small screens or whatever the future holds you know and and high, and so there was that issue there was also cost saving if we introduced a new typeface and we owned it then we could stop paying these licenses on all these other typefaces that we were using and we could bring about a more distinctive typographic tone of voice to the organization. So they were the three things, cost saving, legibility and uh, distinctiveness. And that's what really helped drive this kind of through and, and help it uh, become a success and, and get done. So really 
it took quite a long time to get that across the line for me because I was having to argue this and people have tried to do it, done it. And my predecessors had tried to introduce typefaces in the past to the BBC and failed. And I was kind of doggedly like pursuing this because I saw a real kind of opportunity for us. And um, finally it got signed off after a lot of wearing out of the shoe leather, moving around the business, interacting with lots of stakeholders and showing them the proof of, of why we needed it. And it went through and that's when really we put the call out to a number of different type design agencies of which Bruno's company, Dalton Marg, were one. Um, <clears throat> and they responded with, them, with a fantastic, uh, you know, uh, pitch essentially for the, for the job, which really just demonstrated their ability at creating really beautifully distinctive typefaces, but also their, their fascination and high interest in, in, in accessibility and reading. And so they felt like, and they'd done it for large media organizations before. So we knew we were in good hands. Okay. And so that was the beginning of our, our, our education as a design team at BBC, which is hundreds of people. We got, we, we, we built a group of ambassadors for this project and took them off to, to Bruno's studio in South London to begin our education. And that's where Gareth and me started to learn so much. And it was um, quite, quite wonderful really. So I think Excellent. that's where this, this started. This is where this, this is where the inception of this. And now we get to kind of the, the design of the typeface, which is where I think Bruno maybe should take over. Or yeah, Neil and, and, and I, I, I do want to, I want to jump in a little bit just before, which was to say, ob obviously there were people out there touting that they'd created accessible fonts, particular, yeah. you know, things like uh, dyslexi, uh, read regular, um open dyslexic um yeah, the, yeah. The, the, there's been quite a spate and there's a there's fsb Indeed. and things that yeah. came out and and obviously comic sans has had this this sort of notion behind it that you know it's the an accessible typeface and yes. but it, it's always been a problem with those these things um, and to try and understand what it was because you know oh, tiresias is another one which is the european broadcast font which is probably the oldest of the accessible typefaces um, and you start to look at the research because if someone's making a claim like this you want to know that there's some really hard and fast evidence that has informed the design yeah and we couldn't find that in those things i mean there may be some good stuff within there but it always seemed to be that the evidence came after the production rather than it felt the wrong way around so or it was anecdotal or the, you know, in, in the case of Tiresias, it was, it was, it was just the wrong methodology for, for um, researching type in the first place. I mean, it, it was a screen typeface. So they tested it on paper and point size um, against, you know, the CFAX font and Times New Roman, you know, it was, it was, <laughs> it was a, the methodology just fell apart when you looked at it and go, we, we can't actually take anything from this claim. Um, behind Tiresias and and we we struggled to find much more than anecdote to back anything else up and and uh, you know and some of the anecdote is quite strong but it kind of to understand what's going in there I think it's with open dyslexia it, 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 dyslexic it, 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 that's an interesting one it's just a bigger typeface anyway and one of those things if you put if you run everything in type in point size and measure one against the other and 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 people will always pick the bigger one it doesn't mean it's you just make the other one larger and then they have got no idea which one to pick you know it's just a bigger bigger typeface that does not make it more readable or legible necessarily you know there may be features there may be stuff in there but we just couldn't draw that out so the idea was we need to do this from scratch and this is why you know finding a partner like bruno to work on this that had already you know you'd, you'd already been exploring this with amazon and mm other organizations as well uh with your work on on bookily and and it was to start drawing out some of that stuff of actually no there is there are things in here that are you know enable performance you know they enable people to read and get a flow in reading they you know there is stuff around for some people it's character recognition for some people they need to you know recognize words and for other people there's this circadic flow of words which Bruno needs to explain it way better than I can, but it was just understanding that science of reading and the different ways people do, and then work back from that and saying, okay, what does it need to do? What are those features that support that? And those are those kind of baseline things we need to start building from rather than have a hypothesis, design a font, and then try and, you know, sort of uh, test it or prove it afterwards. 
which is what I felt, you know, which, which obviously, you know, is what we felt was, was happening in that world of accessible type. There's yeah. one thing I would say. So with another thing to say is that, so there were, there were accessible type faces as, as, as Gareth saying, but we would have had to have licensed them. So to own yeah. it yeah. Was, the, was the more cost effective solution, but equally it gave us the opportunity to be best in class and create. What would the BBC do if it was to create a typeface? Well, you would have to create something that was really truly you know, best in class. And that's what we set out to do. What was so lovely about this learning process that we went through from Bruno was, you got all these people in the organization who had no interest in typefaces whatsoever. You know, the business analysts, technical architects, God knows, right? They, but they, we took them on this journey and they all became incredibly nerdy very quickly about typeface design. Now, once that happens, once you learn a thing or two, you like to share it, don't you? You like to share it with your friends and your colleagues. And so they started doing that. So we quickly built this kind of ambassadorship with these people who poured out this information to their respective flocks, so to speak. And then there was this movement that started to build in the BBC around us making, you know, a best in class typeface. So I didn't set out for that to happen, but that's what happened. And we capitalized on it when we saw it happening. It's, very, it's a very good learning for business, this one. Deborah, you have a comment. I know, and I've been very quiet, but the reason why I've been quiet, and first of all, I apologize that my Wi-Fi kicked me off, but um, rural America, we need better connectivity, but I am so fascinated by this because it, you're bringing up things that, as you were saying, David, people would start learning this and realize how powerful this is, and I had no idea Bruno, people like Bruno were doing these things, but it is so fascinating. It really is fascinating. And what I would wonder is, well, kudos to BBC for working with Bruno's team to figure this out. But, and I hear all the things you're saying, but then I also wonder, it sounds like you really have come up with a best in type, uh, typeface. So is this something that you can help others do. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to ask a lot of questions, I bet, on this episode, because this is something I, I, I haven't delved into this, and, but I'm fascinated with the neuroscience of it. And, and just as somebody that, as I've gotten older, I struggle to, I, I have a problem. I, I'm on the computer all day long, but I don't read anymore. What I do is I either have Alexa read Kindle to me, or I do... Um, I, I, I have, I, it's, I, I let them read it to me and I absorb the information better because I recently was diagnosed with dyslexia. I already have ADHD and I'm starting to think those two things are common together, but, mm. but I'm fascinated by what you're saying because I have a daughter with Down syndrome. And then of course my, sadly is my husband, his dementia increased his reading ability really was impacted. So this impacts so many people, but I don't hear anybody talking about this. So I, I just want to say I'm fascinated. I'm just curious at some point when it makes sense in the conversation to, you know, how can everybody else learn from what BBC is doing? And I know that's yeah. partially why we're here. And I'm going to go on mute. Go ahead, Bruno. Yeah, uh, I'd like to jump in on that. You know, first, uh, Deborah, I'd like, I'd like to encourage you to start reading more again because reading like everything, like playing an instrument is something that you get better at with practice, you know. Yeah, I just First have, of, I have something that's called dry eye, so my eyes burn all the time. So, yeah, um, I mean, obviously I, I do appreciate, you know, like, like people have like, you know, uh, a variety of um, afflictions or, you know, deficiencies and, and, and so on and so forth, you know, I appreciate that. But I, th I think first and foremost, we all need to understand that we are not born with the ability to read. Okay. We are not born with that. We have to learn it and we have to practice it. You know, okay. there's, a tiny, there's a tiny little bit in your brain. Uh, in the vast majority of the world's population, it's on your left hemisphere, just sort of like behind the, your, the top part of your ear. And it's, it's the size of the top of your fingertip. And it's called the visual word form area. In there, every single character of any language, irrespective of writing system, is being decoded, but you have to train that part of the brain. You have to train the neurons to recognize the shapes that it is presented with, so it can decode them correctly. Right. So Bruno, and, 
Bruno, so, and I totally interrupted you, I apologize, because I think I could just sit at your feet and listen to you for weeks on end, um, because you're so brilliant, but but are, are you saying, because I've never thought about it from this perspective, are you saying that, because I mean, I do work all day long, I do PowerPoint presentations, I'm, should, but do you also to make sure that you don't lose almost that muscle, we still, yeah. even if it's hurt, ah, oh, that's fascinating, okay, I'm yeah. gonna, yeah, I'm, you see, I'm learning. I'm learning. Thank you. You see, you see, yes. in, order, in order to understand reading, you need to understand neuroscience. And um, the brain is always at full capacity, right? Every single bit, every single neuron in your brain is used, not always at the same time, but every single neuron has a specific function. Um, you know, this whole, this whole thing of people saying, oh, we only use 10% of our brain. I mean, it's complete and utter rubbish. Our brain is used 100%, you know, for different things. If it were doing a 100% at full speed all the time, simultaneously, within about three days, you'd be dead of exhaustion because the brain would use up so many calories, so much energy, you couldn't actually eat that much. It's impossible, you know. But anyways, so... And, and the brain has to do so much so that there is a concept in neuroscience called neuro, um, neuro, neurological recycling. So that basically the brain takes neurons that are lying dormant, that are not being used, and it takes them and uses it for something else, for a new skill, say, for example. And once that's gone, it's gone. You know, it's really, really hard to then grab those neurons back and reutilize them for what you had done previously. You know, the same goes with your visual word form area. The, first of all, the, the less you read, the less you train, the less that area is able to efficiently and quickly and uh, uh, correctly identify and decode the shapes of letters. And the more the brain will be tempted to start doing neural recycling because you're not using it. So therefore, hey, I'm going to take that. You know, you're not making use of it. I'm going to take it. Your loss, not my problem. You know, so so you got to, you got to do that. So that 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 particular part. Now, of course, with the whole reading, you then also have the semantic area, which sits sort of like at the front, you know, near the frontal lobe, uh, where meaning is attached to letters and to sh to letter shapes and to words, etc. And in the reading process, is also involved the phonological area, which is also in your left hemisphere, um, which sits in your primary auditory cortex, very close to the visual word form area, where sound is attached to a visual shape in order to correctly eventually identify uh, what, what the written word means. You know, because that's also a little bit dependent on language. You know, certain languages are opaque, certain languages are transparent. English is a very opaque language where basically nothing sounds like it spells and nothing means what it's written at, etc., etc., which makes it even harder for dyslexics and so on and so forth. Mm. But that's like another three hour episode of Fax Chat, you know. So, so. So, so, but that's just your neural recycling, and I know I kind of like hijacked, you know, the whole, um, the whole conversation in your brain, and I think that's 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 extremely important to understand as well. Yes, obviously you can have you can have a, a deficiency in your eyes, which in a, of course affects what's being sent back into your visual cortex and eventually into your visual word form area. And if you have a blurred image of a character, then the visual word form area has much more difficulty to correctly identify what the shape is. And therefore your reading speed goes down, the legibility goes down, and so et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If the reading speed and the reading flow is um, is interrupted and, and affected, then of course your comprehension is going to be affected as well. So it has a huge amount of repercussions. So now we're going outside of the eyes, you know, and we're going into the actual character shapes. So the more ambiguous the character shapes and the more complex the character shapes, the harder it is for the visual word form area to correctly identify what the letter shapes are, right? So this is why, for example, 
uh, something like Helvetica, a grotesque typeface, is probably or is less legible than a humanist typeface because a grotesque typeface has far more ambiguity. So your brain has to do much more work to correctly and quickly decode the letter shapes. So, so now I'm exhausted. No, Someone else that's is. okay. So well, we need yeah, to feed you. Wow, obviously. wow, but wow. That still is only scratching the surface, believe yeah. me. We, we've been talking about this stuff for over what, three years. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, and we're still unpicking some of this stuff, and and then it you get in, very you get into important, the, very important. Yeah, it is, and and you get into the, which is why we've got you know a serif and a sans serif version of wreath because you know you've got with with the sans version, it's really good for individual character recognition, and the and the serif font is really good for word because serifs that we we learned through this pull the word together as a shape. So if you are a person who really needs whole words. And to get that flow through, that's it's right, isn't it, Bruno? You mm. know, the, the serifs actually are an aid. They are an aid. Read, readability. Exactly, no. they are an aid because they, they disambiguate individual shapes even more. Say, for example, if you have a mirror characters, like a, a B and a D or a P and a Q, you know, with the serifs, you can actually create extra visual cues as to indicate what shape it is. Which so that, I like. I like yeah. when they do that. It helps my brain, like the seven or the one. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, uh, that, that also well, we, brings me. Go on. We built uh, we built some of those characteristics into BBC Reef deliberately as a kind of a design feature as well. Maybe you were about to say that, Bruno. Sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, exactly. I mean, for example, like uh, if you look at uh, the P and the Q. For example, the Q hasn't got a, a spur at the top, you know, where the curve goes into the straight. Quite often you find that there's a little spur sticking, sticking out. The, the Q in, in, in BBC Wreath goes sort of like curves in at an angle. Um, and then you have the P, but the P does have a spur, you know. So again, that's a differentiation between two shapes and that's a Q as to uh, as to how your brain ought to um, uh, kind of like decode the characters. It's you giving know. your brain clues and help and, and assistance exactly. with all of this kind of stuff. And, and exactly. when, when we started unpacking this, you know, I think, I think the arguments often get way oversimplified. You know, there was, there, there was a the poll I saw recently that said serif versus sans serif. And it's like, well, there are hundreds of each one and there are so many different classifications and all those other features. And you can't unpick them and say is one set of features better it's it's a holistic mm. approach and each one of those has a job to do and you know it's 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 a and there are so many features as well when you start there are some very very well, generalistic ones which we've touched so, on so i'm interested in that ones. because because you, you can talk about serif versus sensor yeah. but but weight of font also has a you know a, a significant impact on on legibility yeah, for, for example, we, we talked about Helvetica before. Well, when Apple went from Helvetica to Helvetica New, they made it much more skinny. And, and, and for me, that was a real problem because then I suddenly found it much harder to read anything on my iPhone. Mm. Um, so, so it's not, it's, you know, it's not that uh, there was still sensory fonts, but it was just a lot harder for me to read because it, it became you know i mean, I mean l l let's face it you know there is a reason why a regular typeface you know or what you would call a regular you know why the why the stems in you know, the vertical strokes and by and large you know a little bit thinner uh, the, the the horizontal strokes why they have a certain weight you know this has been tried and tested for the last 500 years or 550 years since Gutenberg basically invented printing with movable type. It's not changed. There is a reason for it, you know. So there's no point for digital designers, you know, in your environment, UI environment to start going thin, you know, when, when uh, a large part of the audience, you know, tends to be over 40, whose eyesight is going to pots basically mm -hmm. you know and and that, that's a natural natural deterioration of our eyesight you know old people old people see less and that's 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 a fact you know yeah. so therefore you have to tell those 20 year old kids with 2020 vision 
to actually start thinking with people a 50 year old in mind, you know, like myself, you know, but anyway, um, um, one of the things also uh, going quickly back to the neuroscience as well, of course, short term memory uh, plays a very important role as well you know, in, in, in the processing. And it has been shown that people who have uh, short-term memory afflictions, you know, find it much harder uh, to read as well. So it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, the quick process that I, uh, I illustrate. It's obviously very, very simplified. Processes are extremely complex in the brain. You have short-term memory involved. You have the visual word form area involved, the semantic area. You have the phonological area involved. On top of that, you also have the entire motor cortex involved. You know, which obviously controls your eye movement, so you can do your saccadic, your saccadic movements across the line, and so basically the brain controlling your eyes to know what you're looking at. You have the visual cortex involved. You have the, the auditory cortex involved. There's two areas called, um, uh, I always confuse them, uh, uh, Wernicke and Broca. One of them is language input. The other one is language output. You know, so, so it's a continuous feedback loop uh, when, when you read, and particularly when you start reading out loud, um, it's a continuous feedback loop, loop that basically is so complex that, that that is really, really, really hard to describe it, you know, because everything is involved, literally everything. And then of course you have numbers. Numbers is a completely different matter because numbers don't get processed in the visual word form area, they get processed in the visual number form area, exactly in the opposite side of the brain, in your arithmetic hemisphere, basically. The left-hand side is primarily linguistic functions, the right-hand side is, pri hand side is primarily arithmetic functions and then there's the cross informational thing between the two hemispheres you know that eventually brings it all together <sighs> okay someone else talk i'm running no, out of no, no, that's, that's good. so um it's we're, amazing we're, and, wow yeah. <laughs> and we're, we're also um you know buffering up on the edge of our time but this is such a fascinating topic that i think that uh people will be happy for us to run over. Uh, I think the, the other thing I just wanted to touch on before we close um, was we've also not touched upon the, the sort of the, the desire to produce something that looks nice and the desire for something that is aesthetically pleasing because one of the objections that I have to some of the um, some of the previous accessible fonts were that they were ugly um, and, and that they were aesthetically displeasing to me to the point where I found that it was off-putting reading. So, I mean, how much is of, of it, a, Neil, is it ugly or is it going back to the science? I, I would be curious, is it going hmm. back to the science that Bruno was saying? Maybe your brain is saying it's ugly because of I, I well, well, so they're fun. deliberately unbalanced, right? Because <laughs> they were they were they were designed to be unbalanced so that you could discern that letters were different. But okay. I yeah. guess when we think of beauty, we think of symmetry and balance. But it's also so appropriateness. Yeah, I think there's yeah. a there's a there's oh a yeah, thing there's that, definitely a bit about appropriateness. Yeah, and and I think the 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 famous one of when you know we the, the scientists at CERN announced the Higgs boson. And, uh, and they did their PowerPoint in Comic Sans and there were more tweets on the day about the typeface than the greatest scientific discovery of our age. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's because they made the whole thing look like a nursery newsletter and that was inappropriate. Yeah, it, it was, well, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I mean, you know, the start is going as far back as 1927 by Poffenberger and Franken, who were two, who were two uh, psychologists and they looked into the look and feel of typefaces and they did a whole study and they, they, they compared different stylistic uh, expressions of typefaces, the look and feel, and had people match them to certain industries and to, you know, primarily within an advertising context. And they found that the vast majority of people, irrespective of whether male or female, would place certain typefaces in certain categories, you know, pretty much unfailingly, you know. 
and so clearly we we, we associate culturally uh, or maybe because of shape etc cetera, etc cetera, culturally or maybe also natively um, we associate certain shapes and certain certain types of letter forms with certain industry with certain types of uh, types of information and communication yeah just a so um, with so with bringing back to Ruth for a second, so with Ruth, since the typeface had to be a representation of the BBC's tone of voice, it had to have a variety of styles and weights to be able to sort of echo something of the different types of content that we're publishing, but equally something of a reflection of society as well. There had to be different kinds of tones of voice or accents, so to speak, in our typographic presentation. So that's why we developed quite a large uh, font family for BBC Ruth. But back to what you were saying, Neil, before about um, about it, it actually looking nice and, and feeling like the right thing, the right typeface or being desirable. I mean, one of the things that we talk about a lot between Gareth, myself and Bruno is about, is about the three pillars of accessibility. So there's, there's technical, you know, is it built correctly? Is it functional? Does it work? And, and emotional, emotional accessibility, does it, does it appeal? Yes. And I think if you don't have that in, initially, then they ain't going to even, they're not going to care if it works or, or functions because yeah. they're not going to look at it. So, that, so that's a huge part of accessibility as well. Yeah. yeah. And I, th I think it's also important to see those three points, you know, uh, emotional, functional and technical um, as, as a, a holistic triangle. You know, n none can work in isolation. They, uh, they always harmonize together. And if you get yeah. the sweet spot, then you have the most optimal typeface you know i'm not saying the perfect but i say the most optimal because perfection doesn't exist no and i i, I always remember when my days back at uv was talking to a group of of teenagers who and we were talking about their assistive tech and some of them had a, a lot of stuff attached to their chairs they had their pcs and various input devices and technologies and i remember the general mood was a lot of them really hated them because they made them they they were self they're teenagers they're self-conscious they're going through what every teenager does they want cool stuff and yet it all looks like it was designed by fisher price and yeah. and and they they absolutely hated their kit and they wanted something that looked cool and sophisticated and you know and and functional and so that it felt it said something it reflected something about themselves and the way they wanted to feel about Absolutely. themselves and to have something that looked like it was out of a book for a five-year-old for a 17-year-old is is humiliating yes. um and uh, and so you know we we associate we we have to have that connection and we have to feel comfortable mm. and and as, as neil said some of those typefaces they look like they've come from scooby-doo or you know it's yes. all the goodies or something that's a uk <laughs> reference by the way deborah you won't get but it was <laughs> it's that you know they just they just don't look they're wrong they're out of place and yes. and and in, it it becomes difficult there may be some good stuff in there yeah. but it's but, incongruous yeah. it feels incongruous um we've definitely run over now so i do need to thank uh my clear text for uh, keeping us captioned bart face access for you know, keeping supporting us over the years and and, and mike Rillings also so um it only remains to thank bruno david and gareth for what has Thank been you. a fascinating chat today. I'm really Thank looking you. forward to the, the conversations on Twitter on Tuesday. Thank you very much. And thank you, you, BBC, con for continuing to really raise the bar for everybody. I, I ask all the time in the US, who's the best? And I say, BBC. I, 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 I tell people that all the time. And obviously, because you're working with people like Bruno, so applause, <laughs> applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, folks.